All right, brethren, let's go back here now to John chapter 6. <clears throat> we saw Sunday how the Lord worked this mighty miracle and He fed this multitude of people. We know there was upwards of twenty to 30,000 people in this multitude. and So after He feeds them, we read in verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, they saw the miracle He did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. The other, uh, one of the Gospels speaks about how that the Lord sent the multitude away and he also sent his apostles and his disciples away, sent his apostles across the sea. And then he went up into a mountain alone to pray. Now, he performed this miracle, and they got excited. They said, this is that prophet, this is that prophet that was to come, that should come into the world. They're taking this from Deuteronomy 18, 15, where Moses said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him shall you hearken. Now these natural children, they were all the natural children of Israel. They were all looking for this prophet. They knew this prophet was coming. And they, they even called him Messiah. But they had no spiritual understanding. The Pharisees, remember, sent to John the Baptist. And they came to him and they said, Are thou that prophet? They were looking for this prophet. Art thou that prophet? He said, no. The Samaritan woman knew that Christ would be the prophet. She said, I perceive, sir, you're a prophet. And then she said, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, and when he's come, he'll tell us all things. She knew about this scripture of Moses. Later in John 7, they they kind of got into a dispute over it, talking about, is this the prophet? Some said, this is the Christ. And then they said, well, well, he can't be, he's supposed to be the seed of David, and he's supposed to come out of Bethlehem, be born of Bethlehem, and they got into a disagreement over it. They knew the prophet was coming. They knew he was the Messiah, but they didn't have spiritual understanding of who he was. Now, what jumped out at me about this verse is this verse... There's salvation in our Lord rejecting this multitude. We see our salvation in this. In our Lord rejecting this multitude, we see the faithfulness of our King. This is by whom we're saved. I want to show you four things. I want to show you His faithfulness concerning temptation. I want to show you His faithfulness concerning the covenant. His faithfulness concerning His high his office as a high priest, and then his faithfulness in saving his people. Now, first of all, let's see his faithfulness concerning temptation. Now, this is a great multitude of people, a great multitude of people, and they desire to take him by force and make him king. But our Lord refused this. He refused it. Now, the devil had already tempted him in the wilderness, Go back over to Matthew 4 and look there. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8. It says again, The devil taketh him up into exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. One of the gospels says in a moment, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world beginning to end and all the glory of those kingdoms. And he said to him, All these things will I give thee, if thou will fall down and worship me. And then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The devil's temptation in the wilderness was to have the Savior worship him rather than God the Father. He only had 
power as the devil temporarily while while the Lord came to save his people and that was only by the sovereign will of God he he was allowed to to uh, come in and beguile Eve and so Dave, uh, Adam fell through her as a figure as a figure as a head for when Christ would come and save his people strictly for the glory of God that he was given any power but the devil knew Christ is coming to crush his head and he's going to save his people. He's going to deliver us from our sins. And by that, take away all the power the devil had to accuse us. And so he wanted to see the, the Lord fall down and worship him. And, and he tempted him with all the kingdoms all in a moment. And our Lord said, thou shalt worship the Lord. It's written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And him only shalt thou serve. Well, this right here is just another attempt by the devil. We're not told that, but you know he's still trying everything that he brought before our Redeemer. He's trying to, to make our Redeemer falter. And our Savior rejected this because he's faithful to the Father. He was not going to have this multitude make him a king. He, he's the representative of his people and he came to faithfully serve the Father for his people. He, he said, I must be about my Father's business. And here we see his perfect obedience to what to us would have been a great temptation. And to the, those apostles and those disciples, it would have been a great temptation. And our Lord faithfully rejected that. He faithfully uh, looked to the Father. Now, you think about this, brethren. It's only by the faithfulness of Christ as our King in whom we're perfectly, we have perfectly resisted temptation in Him. All temptation. We resisted all temptation. Just looking at this right here, Him rejecting this multitude. Think how tempting that would be to you and to me. But in him, we've perfectly been obedient to the Father. And, and he's laid down his life and paid for the sins for us sinning when we've been brought into trial and our sinful flesh has led us away in temptation. But you think about it, how often we fail when we're tempted. You think what a temptation this was for the apostles. Twenty or 30,000 people are wanting to take their master and make him the king, and they're in the inner circle with him. They're like his, you know, his inner circle, and, and they want to come and make him a king. That would be tempting for them because they were, at that time, they were looking for an earthly kingdom too. The apostles were. They didn't understand fully what Christ was doing. You know, you take the Lord, and, and uh, I've seen the Lord move. I saw him move my pastor, and sometimes that happens. But you see so many tempted by, you know, a larger congregation, and it's going to make it easier on their life, and it's going to uh, give them some ease, and, and maybe there's some past glory attached to it or whatever. What's going to keep his people being faithful to him? You see a promotion and prosperity come and, and people are taken away from the gospel. What's going to keep you from that? He is. He's the one who is faithful to keep his people, but he's also the one, you know, even thinking about it is covetousness. And he's the one who faithfully served the Father so that in him we've resisted temptation perfectly. Perfectly. And he paid for our sin for where we have it. This is why we pray, lead us not into temptation. He taught us to pray this. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why? For thine is the kingdom. He did this as the king. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. And so we, we see his faithfulness in temptation. And thankfully, he keeps us by that same faithfulness. Now, secondly, look here. We see his faithfulness in rejecting this multitude because he's remaining true to the everlasting covenant. Before this world was made, God the Father already made him the king. He entered covenant with him in an everlasting decree saying he will be the king and that he would bless his seed in him and that he would 
he would raise him as the God man to sit on the throne forever. Go over to Psalm 89. And so he, he's not looking to any man to make him a king. He's, he's being faithful to the covenant of the Father. Psalm 89, verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. This is what we're seeing. His faithfulness to the covenant of the Father who made him a king. Rather than these men that want to make him a king. For I've said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. This is God the Father and God the Son. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I've sworn unto David my servant. That's Christ he's speaking about. God's speaking about Christ. I made a covenant with David my servant, Christ. Thy seed will I establish forever. That's you and me who are his elect. My, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. See how he's talking about a throne? He promised him the throne. He said, Selah, think about that. You and I should look at this and say, that's our salvation. Because that covenant, him being faithful to that covenant to be the king appointed by the Father, had that's our salvation. Look at verse 5. The heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, and thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Look down at verse 29. His seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. That's speaking of, of Christ and his elect. And he says there, and if his children sin, I'll chasten them as a father because he does that because the stroke of justice fell on our Redeemer. And thank God for that, that he, he, did, he will chasten us and save us from us. But look at verse 33. He says, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. Once I've sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. Do you see that in this verse? I see in this verse, first his faithfulness in rejecting any temptation. And that's our, that's our salvation from all temptation is in him. And then you see his faithfulness here being true to the covenant because the Father has decreed he, He's made an everlasting covenant with Him. And so Christ is faithful to the Father because He's fulfilling that covenant for His seed. Well, you know, you read over there when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and Peter said, David was speaking of Christ. It's His throne that's forever. And our Lord has raised Him and He's, he's both Lord and Christ. He's the King. And so he was faithful, and that's our salvation. That is our salvation because he was faithful to that covenant. Now look at this third thing. Just by him rejecting, by him rejecting this multitude of people that want to make him king. That just struck me, brethren, because that would be tempting. That would be very tempting. You know, a, a, a church gets a new building, that's very tempting to lift you up in pride. You know, these things are so easily sway us. What's going to keep us? He does. And here's his faithfulness now. I want to show you this third thing. As the high priest. See, he had a work to do before he ascends to the throne to be the king and be consecrated as the king publicly as the God-man who is our king. He's got a high priestly work to do. He couldn't have these people take him and, and make him a king and, and, and announce it to the world because he's, he's got to be consecrated by God but only after he's fulfilled his high priestly work. He wouldn't ascend to the throne in heaven as king to accomplish that work for his people. Over in uh, Hebrews 2, verse 17. came to honor the law and he came to redeem his people. And he did it 
came to do it as the high priest who is himself the lamb. And look at Hebrews 2.17. It says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like to his, unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now, some of the commentaries point out that he, after he sent the multitude away, and after he sent his apostles away, and he went up into that mountain alone. The other Gospels are pointing out other characteristics of our Redeemer, but John's talking about him as, as the king and as the priest and all that he accomplished as God, and he doesn't say he prayed. He's going to talk about him in John 17 praying, but that's as a high priest. And so they point out that him going up into that mountain alone is a shadow of Luke 16, set, I mean uh, Leviticus 16, 17. Let me read this to you. It says, There shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when the high priest goes in to make atonement in the holiest of holies until he come out and has made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And so they say in that picture of him going up into the mountain alone, is a, is a foreshadowing of how he had to go and perform this high priestly work alone. Nobody could help him. He had to suffer on the cross alone. He had to enter into the holiest of holies alone. And, and, and it had to be by his own blood. And so when he did that and he accomplished that, now where is he? Did he do it by himself? Hebrews 1.3 said he by himself purged our sin. And then what does it say? And then he sat down where? On the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 8 in verse 1 says, We have such a high priest who sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heaven. They want to make him a king. He had to fulfill this high priestly work first. But he did it. Now where is he? He's sitting in the throne as our high priest and our king priest. He says there in... Uh, and uh, back in Hebrews 1 in verse 8, he says, Unto the Son, unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So he's, by doing this, rejecting men making him king, he went and did this high priestly work, accomplished redemption for us, and he's entered in now, and he's seated in the throne in glory, and it's by his blood and by his spirit that he makes us king priests. He's the, he's the king and the high priest, and he makes us king priests because he rejected what, in faithfulness, he rejected what they tried to do. Now, lastly, I want to show you how we see his faithfulness in rejecting this multitude when while he rejected them, he called sinners like us who are no different from them. Absolutely no different from them. And I thought this applied to what's going on in the world today. By nature, we were like this multitude. They called him a prophet. They called him Messiah. And there's a lot of folks who regard the Lord Jesus Christ as a prophet, like Buddha and like Muhammad, a teacher. A teacher. And they teach his precepts, but they despise the fact that he actually came and accomplished redemption for a chosen people, and that he alone is the righteousness and the holiness and the redemption and the wisdom of his people. But that's who he is. He's not just a teacher. But here's the thing. You and I who he saved were no different than those folks. We were no different than that multitude. And the multitude was looking for, they were looking for somebody to be their king in this life. They were looking for somebody to give them blessings in this life, give them ease in this life, free them from the Roman Empire that they hated, and they thought this was the one to do it. That's no different than what's going on in our nation right now. Men looking for earthly deliverance, earthly ease from an earthly king in an earthly nation, an earthly kingdom. That's us when we were dead in our sin. Why did he reject them? 
and called us. They would have received him as long as they made him king by force. They would have, they're going to come into Jerusalem crying Hosanna and praising him as the king anyway. And a few days later, they're going to be crying out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. But they'd have taken him if he would have let them make him king by their force. What a boast is it for sinners to say, I made him Lord of my life. He already is king. They came to him when he was born. They said, where is he that's born king of the Jews? Were you different? I wasn't any different from that. This is the sin nature of every fallen sinner. This is our sin nature now. What are we trying to do? We want to take Christ by force and put him on the throne for selfish gain. That's what we wanted. That's what our sin nature is. That's what the sin nature is with man is. We'll put him on the throne when we need some blessings. But if we want to rule things, let's take him off the throne and put ourselves in the throne. That's the nature in each of us. But our king is God all-knowing. And he says here, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he knows every heart. He knows every single heart. He knows the hearts of the regenerate and the hearts of the unregenerate. Everything is just naked as can be with him. He sees everything, knows everything, hears everything. And it says back in John 2 and verse 24, the Lord Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all and he needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. He knew what they were coming, what they, what they were doing. So if there's no difference between them and us, what made the difference? Why did he reject them and call you? It's nothing but the grace of God. That's it. The grace of God, that's the only thing. He knows his sheep that he chose, that he came to lay down his life for. He sovereignly calls his sheep and he makes us know him. He knows his own. And our king priest makes his child see we're sinners. He makes us know we're sinners. And he won't let us stop knowing we're sinners. They didn't, there was going to be no... No broken heart in this. There was going to be no falling down on his, before his feet in this thing. They were going to just come make him a king. But he's going to make his child know we're sinners. And he doesn't let us stop knowing we're sinners. He brings us to cry for mercy at his feet. And he keeps us at his feet. He keeps us like Mephibosheth looking down and saying, Lord, what is it that you would have mercy on a dead dog like me? Like the publican who's on his face saying, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. That's constant. He's going to keep us there. He's going to make us know his kingdom is spiritual, his salvation is eternal. It's not an earthly thing. He said in John 18, 36, My kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would be out here in the street fighting, trying to make political change. And it's not. They're not. Because my kingdom's not of this world. The kingdom of God is within you. If you've been born of the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God is Christ our King. And if Christ has been formed in us, the kingdom is within us. That's why it comes without observation. This is how he makes us know he's the king. He wields his scepter of righteousness in our hearts. And he doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. It's a scepter of righteousness, of power. And he wields that in the hearts of his people. This is how he makes us believe he's the priest and the lamb in whom we're complete. He rules this world and He rules the lives of His people for the sake of His people. He purchased us with His blood. I'm a, I'm, I believe Him. You believe Him? He purchased us. He bought us. And He's ruling everything 
in the whole world and in each of our lives and in our lives collectively to keep us knowing that we're His. He chastens us for our good if He has to strip us of everything we, ha we have. He's going to break us. And He's going to bring us to cry out to Him. And He does that only to those He loves. Only to those He loves. We can be so cruel about that. And He only does it to those He loves. Why? To keep us partaking of His holiness. Not trusting ourselves for anything. To, so that we're not judged with this world. That's, that's mercy. That's grace. That's what He does as a faithful King for His people. And He uses us through this Gospel to call out all the other fellow citizens of this kingdom. This is the weapon. That's not, it's not a carnal weapon. This is it. And He's doing this for that purpose. He said in Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Every enemy is going to be made his footstool. Every one of them. Those that are his by divine election, they're going to come down to his feet by his grace. And those that are not are going to bow and confess he's king of kings and lord of lords. But all are going to be made his footstool. And how does he do this? The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And the result be thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning because thou hast to do with thy youth. The Lord has sworn it. He will not repent. You're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Our king priest is doing this through his gospel. He's the same yesterday. He hadn't changed. He was the same. He's the same today. He'll be the same tomorrow. And he's ruling his kingdom. He's ruling the hearts of his people. And he, everything that's coming to pass in this world is happening right on track, exactly according to his purpose. And his people are going to worship him. They're going to worship him. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Are there any poor and needy? Anybody poor and needy? I mean poor and needy. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth. The poor also in him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. There were some people he came in contact with that wasn't poor and needy. But everybody he came in contact with is poor and needy. We don't ever stop being poor and needy, do we? He don't ever stop saving us. What about the enemy? Look at Revelation 17. Look at verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Why? For He's Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him, they're called and chosen and faithful. He said every knee's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess. He's Lord to the praise and glory of God. Now he's made us a royal priesthood, Peter said, to show forth his praises. And he's going to keep chastening his people. He's going to keep saving us from the lusts of our flesh that war against our soul. And when he does this, as he does this, he's going to use us to, to preach his word. He's going to keep on purifying his people, cleansing his people, making us walk in the good works he's ordained for us to walk in. He's not going to fail in that at all. And so he tells us there, he says, while the world is rebelling against authority, he says for us to submit to all the magistrates that he's put in place. You know why? Because he's the king. He's calling the shots. He's ruling it all. And there's nothing out of his power, nothing whatsoever, that's not accomplishing his purpose, every bit of it. This is the faithfulness of our king. Look one more time over there at Revelation 3. I want to show you this last verse. He's going to make us overcome by his blood, by this testimony we have that he's our all. And he says here in Romans 3.21, 
He says, And to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. That salvation, that's our whole salvation in the rejection of them trying to make him a king. The perfection of, of every temptation we enter into is Christ. He's faithful at, as the king to the covenant of the Father by whom we're saved by his everlasting covenant. He's faithful as our high priest. He had to accomplish that work before he ascended to the throne, and he did it. And he's faithful. It's by the faithfulness of our king that he called us, keeps us, keeps teaching us, keeps chasing us, keeps growing us, and one day we're going to be with him and cast it all before him and praise him as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the faithfulness of our king. I pray he bless it. Father, we thank you and we ask you to make this word speak to our hearts. We ask you for that. We ask you to rule in our midst with that word and humble us and keep us and strengthen us. Lord, work your will. We're thankful, Father, that we know that your king's on your holy hill and that everything is coming to pass in this world right now. He's ruling it, and it's all accomplishing your purpose for the salvation of your people. Lord, thank you that we can be confident in this and know that you're going to keep your people, protect your people, teach your people. Lord, keep us ever mindful that everything you're doing for your people is for our good. Keep us knowing that, that everything that we encounter is to save us from our sins and to help us to be helpers of others to to help to point to Christ and edify with Christ and strengthen with Christ. and Lord, make us truly be servants of your kingdom. Rule in our hearts, rule in our midst. Lord, thank you for mercy. Thank you that that covenant says you'll keep mercy forever for your people. We ask you for Christ's sake, Lord, please be merciful. We thank you for, for your mercy and your forgiveness. In Christ's name, amen.